People sometimes wonder what the teaching on karma has to do with meditation. Well, the first thing it has to do is the fact that you're meditating is a type of karma. You set up an intention and you try to stick with it. Now the intention itself is the karma, and the intention to stick with it is the karma. And you want to do this as skillfully as possible. Otherwise, you don't just set up a good intention and hope that the good intention on its own is going to take care of everything. You check carefully to make sure what you're doing and the results you're getting right now. Because in line with the Buddha's teachings on causality, the fact that you're having any experience of the six senses at all right now involves three things. It's the results of past karma, your present karma, and the results of your present karma. All those things mixed together. Which means that in some cases, what you do right now is going to give you results right now. Some of the things you're experiencing right now have to do with what you're deciding to do right now and what you're actually doing. So try to do this well, and you begin to see some of the results right now. When the results don't come, then you may wonder about what about that past karma. The Buddha doesn't have people think too much about past karma, except in the general principle that you want to do good karma right now, skillful karma right now, as much as you can. And be prepared for the fact that there may be some bad things coming out of your past karma. It's like being a cook. You want to be able to cook well with whatever your ingredients are. You know the cooks who have to have only the best ingredients and only the best pots and pans and only the best stoves and whatever. Those are not really the skilled cooks. The skilled cooks are the ones who can take anything, make good food out of it. And as the Buddha said, if you try to trace back where your past karma is coming from, who's responsible, who's at fault, or who can be credited with it, you go crazy. There are many stories in the commentaries about people who develop a real animosity for each other, and then from life after life after life they come and they go back and forth. A kills B, and then in the next lifetime B kills A, and the next time around A kills B again, to the point where you don't really know, well, who's it to blame? Everybody's to blame. And so the issue becomes moot. The real issue right now is, if there's anything bad coming in from the past, how do you learn not to suffer from it? And at the same time, how do you learn not to react to things coming in that are bad or good in a way that makes you do things that are unskillful? Because sometimes good things come in, you get complacent, and then you get unskillful in the present moment again. When bad things come in, you lash out in anger. That too can lead to unskillful behavior now. So first you want to put the mind in a position where it's not going to be so affected by whatever comes in from the past. And the Buddha recommends two things. One is developing an attitude of unlimited goodwill, compassion, empathetic joy, equanimity. These are called the Brahma Viharas. They're called sublime abidings. They're the attitudes of people who have really well-developed concentration. A sense of well-being inside that then they want to share with others, and they don't think only about their own narrow little Im limited interests. They think broadly. And by thinking broadly and sharing this sense of a good attitude broadly, the Buddha makes a comparison. He says it's like a very wealthy person who incurs a debt or incurs a fine. The authorities come and they ask for the debt to be paid back, they ask for the fine to be paid back, and because the person has a lot of wealth, he hardly feels it at all. The other type of person is someone who's very narrow-minded, doesn't care about genuine well-being for himself or other people, or herself or other people, 
has very little compassion, very little empathetic joy. Can't remain equanimous over things that arise in life. That kind of person is like someone who's very poor. The authorities come and they ask for the money for the fine, and the person doesn't have it. Gets dragged off to jail. There's another passage where the Buddha says that these attitudes are the wealth of a practitioner. So you can pay back your debts. John Lee makes a lot of this, as I mentioned last night. The goodness that comes from the meditation is the mind gets more and more saturated with a sense of well-being. And your sense of the boundaries that separate you from other people begin to wear down. You begin to get more sympathetic with their well-being as well. This actually minimizes the impact of past bad karma. As he says, you hardly feel it at all, because the mind's in a different state. The other way of preparing the mind to deal with anything coming in from bad from the past is try to train the mind so that it's not overcome by pleasure and not overcome by pain. In other words, you can stand the pain. You can also stand the pleasure. It may sound like a strange idea, but all too often when pleasures come, we just wallow in them, slurp them up, and totally lose our mindfulness. And of course, we then behave in unskillful ways. This is one of the reasons why we work with the breath to try to allow it to be comfortable. So you get used to having this sense of pleasure with you. Then it becomes no big deal. Everyone's been through this stage in the practice where you've been trying and trying and trying and nothing seems to work, and finally one night everything clicks. Everything falls into place. There's a great sense of well-being, and you try to grab it, and it's like grabbing thin air. And grabbing it, of course, destroys it. It's because you let yourself get too excited about it. But if you work at it enough, come back, come back, come back, and get used to the fact there are going to be good days and bad days. And when the good days come, you learn not to get excited about it. You try to learn from it so that it eventually becomes more and more of a skill. In other words, you see, well, what did I do that brought about these results? And again, it's like cooking. Sometimes you've got good food as you sit down to prepare your meal. But there are other times you begin to realize, okay, even though the food isn't all that good, I can still make something good out of this. There may be pains in different parts of the body, but you learn how to work around them. You learn how to breathe through them. There are days when the breath throughout the body seems nothing but iron bands. You say, just let it go. Think of the breath. There, there's a soothing breath. There's a calming breath that just radiates. It has no clear lines, no clear boundaries. That can begin to dissolve those iron bands away. Which means even though that there's bad food coming in from the market that day, you, you can deal with it. You can turn it into good food. And as a sense of well-being gets more developed, and you can approach pains in the body with a lot more equanimity. And when you can develop that equanimity, you don't feel so threatened by things. You can actually look into them. That's what the Buddha calls the, the duty with regard to suffering is to comprehend it. And primarily he's focusing on the suffering of the stress in the mind. But to do that, you have to understand, well, how does the mind conceive, say, pain in the body? How does it conceive un pleasant emotions in a way that makes it suffer even more. As most of us, as the Buddha said, when we're struck with a pain of some kind, it's like being shot with one arrow, and then we shoot ourselves with a few more arrows over that. Well, it turns out it's those extra arrows that are the real problem. But you have to look into that response. Why does that first arrow get you to grab your bow and grab your quiver and pull out all the arrows you can and then shoot yourself. Why do you do that? What, it is, what is it about that first pain 
that get you all worked up? Well, it's because you have some strange perceptions around it. Look into those. John Mahabhu has a lot of great questions you can ask yourself. There's a pain in the knee, there's a pain in the hip. Is the pain the same thing as the knee? Is it the same thing as the hip? Well, no. They seem to be right there. The pain has totally covered everything in the hip, totally penetrated everything in the hip, but it's not the case. It's like different radio waves in the same spot in the room. You can put your radio anywhere and you can get stations from San Diego, you can get stations from Los Angeles, Tijuana, Phoenix, whatever. It's all in the same spot, but they're in a different frequency. Well, pain is a different frequency from your physical sense of the body. If you can see it that way, then the pain can be there, the body can be there, your awareness can be there. They're all there, but they're on different channels. The mind doesn't feel like it has to take the pain on. So this way, whatever comes, you can handle. The results of past bad karma just get less and less and less. And again, you don't have to trace them back to who's at fault and where do they come from. That doesn't solve any problems at all. What solves the problems is learning how to deal with these things in the present moment so they don't have such an impact on the mind. And that frees the mind so it's a lot more able to respond in a skillful way. Then you look more carefully at this present action, the fact that you do have some freedom here. All too often people think of the Buddhist teachings on karma as being deterministic, that you're going to have to suffer in the present moment from something you did in the past, or you're going to have to enjoy something. And the people who are enjoying things now, those are the ones with good karma, the people with pains and problems right now, those are the people with bad karma. And the happy people deserve to be happy, and the unhappy ones deserve to be unhappy. That's not the case. Again, think of the cook. You can get some pretty bad produce coming in, but you can do something good with it if you're really good. So you have some freedom here. There are some Jains who another sect at the time of the Buddha. And they believed that everybody had bad karma and they had to just endure it. If they could endure it without moving, then they'd be okay. That would be burning off the old karma. And the Buddha went to ask them. It's one of the few times the Buddha actually went to somebody else to engage in an argument. He says, how do you know that this pain you're feeling right now is the result of your past karma? Haven't you noticed that when you don't do your austerities, there's no pain? And when you do do them, there, there is pain? Now, so how can you attribute it all to your past karma? They didn't have much of an answer. They hadn't thought of that. What he's pointing out is that what you're doing right now makes a huge difference. And you've got this freedom. So make the most of it. This is why meditation focuses on the present moment, because this is the moment where you are free to choose. Free to develop good qualities, or if you want to do something something else, you're free to do that. But haven't we had enough of our old wandering around, putting up excuses not to train ourselves? Maybe it's time just to get to work and say, I've got to learn how to do this skillfully. And learn how to read what you're doing so that you don't engage in recriminations. You just learn to have a more equanimous attitude. So again, you're not so threatened from past karma, you're not threatened by what's happening right now. So you can look at things with more with more objectivity. It's like learning any kind of skill. If your emotions go up and down with every stir in the pot, you're really in trouble. You have a bad day when the food gets burned. If you get really upset about that, you're in trouble. You just notice, okay, burn the food today, don't do that again. 
next time around. Because there always is a next time around. They keep coming and coming and coming. You've got another chance, another chance, another chance. To figure out what you did wrong and then learn how to do it right. This involves two qualities that John Fuing stressed again and again. It's one, be observant. Two, use your ingenuity. If the breath is tight and constricted, ask yourself, is there another level of breath? So you can just leave this level of breathing and focus on the level of breath that's a lot more comforting, soothing. It's there. After all, this is the force of life. Open your mind to new possibilities of what sensations in the body actually are breath sensations. Maybe you've been pushing and pulling liquid sensations around, mistaking them for the breath. And that just gets things all bollocked up. So the lesson here is that it's the skills you're developing that really matter. The ingredients that you find in the kitchen that day, well, sometimes they're pretty meager, but you can learn how to make good, simple meals out of meager things. And learn to appreciate the fact that there's some potentials that you may not have noticed. We talked about that idea that if you're happy right now, that means you have good karma. If you're unhappy, that means you have bad karma. Well, that doesn't mean you have only good or only bad. Everybody's got good and bad in their field. To change the analogy, as the Buddha said, it's like a field full of seeds. Some of the seeds are ready to sprout, some of them are not quite ready. Some of them will sprout right now. No matter what you do, others are going to sprout if you water them. So try to water the good ones. And don't look down on other people because they're suffering, because maybe they've got some unsprouted good seeds. Or maybe you've got some unsprouted bad seeds in your field. Another complaint people have about karma is the idea that if somebody is suffering, they deserve to suffer, so you're going to leave them that way, which is not the case. Again, nobody deserves to suffer. Actions just have results. But the state of mind with which you're done and the state of mind with which, you're, with which you receive them can make a huge difference. And if it seems hard-hearted to say other people are suffering because of their karma, you have to ask yourself, is your compassion so pure that you can only give it to pure people? We're all in this together. Our compassion has to spread to everybody, good and bad. Those who have good, done good things, those who have done bad things, because we've all done both good and bad things. It's a great equalizer. In the sense of the basic principle underlying it, at the moment there are inequalities. Some people are very happy, some people are very fortunate, others are not at all. But we're all living in the same principle. And as the Buddha said, when you see someone who's really wealthy and enjoying all sorts of power and pleasures, Remind yourself, you've been there. If you see someone really poor, and the example he gave was a leper living on the side of the street, remind yourself, you've been there too. This way your compassion can learn how to be not condescending, and your attitude towards people who are wealthy can be free from any kind of jealousy or resentment. Because as we all know, these things go up and they go down, and then they go up again and then down again, until you learn how to get out of the cycling completely. That's the other feature of karma, but given that you've got these two principles acting together, there's the present karma and there's the past karma, it makes things very complex. But the virtue of a complex system is that you take the principles that put it together and you play them in a certain way and makes the whole system break down. In this case, you, you realize that this can just go on and on and on forever. 
Consciousness depends on craving, craving depends on consciousness, and they feed each other along the way. But if you feed the mind really well until it's really strong, it doesn't need that companion of craving anymore. It doesn't need, it doesn't need to feed. You bring it to a point of equilibrium through the development of both insight and tranquility. And another dimension opens up, the dimension that's outside the system. So it's because karma is complex that it can be so maddening trying to figure things out. But once you do apply the basic principles, and this is why we're so fortunate we have the Buddha who's set out the principles. You can use those principles to make yourself free, to find the freedom that's waiting for everyone who learns how to use these principles well.